This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. It's both kind and rational To like knowing animals I can't deny it's fashionable To like knowing animals Hello everyone and welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals, a podcast in which we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Josh Milburn and I do like knowing animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA, that's A-A-S-A, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. I'm a member and I encourage you to become one too. Membership is very reasonably priced. The episode is also brought to you by the Animal Publics book series from Sydney University Press. This is a great collection of books about animal studies. Today we're talking about anthrozoology, which, as you might expect, is well represented in the series. Also a quick shout out to Elizabeth Usher, who provided the updated theme tune for Knowing Animals. To learn more about Elizabeth, visit veganthused.com. Today I'm very pleased to introduce you to Jess Hooper. Jess is a PhD candidate in anthrozoology at the University of Exeter and the Campaigns and Research Manager for the Badger Trust, a British animal protection organisation. The working title of Jess's PhD thesis is Civets in Society, Understanding the Human-Animal Interactions Within Civet Trades. She's also the founder of the Civet Project, an organisation devoted to better understanding human-civet interactions. And after that introduction, you might not be surprised to hear that today we're going to be talking about civets. In particular, we're going to talk about Jess's paper, Cat Puccino and Captive Wildlife, Tourist Perceptions of Balinese Copiluac Agrotourism, which was published open access in the journal Society and Animals in 2022. Welcome to the podcast, Jess. Hi, thanks very much for having me, Josh. So can you start by telling us what led to you working on this topic? Yeah, sure. So this goes back to about 2013, when the BBC released a undercover documentary exploring how coffee luwak or civic coffee was or is produced. And civic coffee is coffee that has been digested through the Asian palm civet. And so it's said to be a very luxurious, smooth tasting coffee. And because of this, it's and its rarity, uh, it's the most expensive coffee in the world. Or so they claim. Civet coffee is produced en masse by taking civets, which is a small uh, nocturnal carnivore from Southeast Asia, and they cage them in very, well, awful conditions. And then they force feed them coffee and then collect the coffee beans. They then clean and dry and roast the coffee beans, and that's how civet coffee is created. And in this undercover documentary, not only were they showing the awful conditions that these animals are held in, but I also noticed that it wasn't just palm civets that were were in these enclosures, it was also binturong. And I had just finished doing uh, my undergrad research project, which was a behavioural study on binturongs. And so I was very drawn to this charismatic animal and I was quite shocked that they were all being called civets, even though these were two distinct species. So I have been interested in civet coffee since that time, primarily for two reasons. The first is the absurdity of this product. I was really intrigued by what made the commodification of faeces something that could be a luxury product, something that was going to be internationally renowned and something that was meant to be really expensive. I just, I didn't understand that. And then also I was interested in the cultural interpretations of this product and these animals. And why is it that for me, I saw two very distinct species, but in Indonesia, civets are just known as musangs and that they don't really see the difference between all the different species. So I was really interested in, well, how do these animals engage with people on a day-to-day basis? What's their role in human society? What's their role in the ecology? And really, there isn't much information about civets. They're a very elusive and, and poorly known animal. So that's really where it all started. Can I start with a very basic question? Could you tell us a bit about civets? If a listener hasn't heard of a civet or can't quite picture what a civet is, what should they be imagining? 
Oh, that's a really great way of framing it because civets taxonomically are a little bit confusing. There are debates in the literature whether there are 33 species, whether some of those are subspecies or aren't even in the family at all. So some people would say there's 35 species. But really what you're what you should be imagining is an animal the size of a cat. They look very cat-like because they are the most ancient form of feline. And if you think of a binturong, which is much larger, it's the largest of all of the civets, they have a prehensile tail, which means they can use their tail as a fifth limb. However, all of the other species are, they they can't use their tail in that way. So they're more like what you would expect a, a cat to look like. There are some pelage variations amongst the species. Generally, they have a combination of spots and stripes. Some of them have a kind of a mask across the face. They come in many different colours and variations, just like our domestic house cats, and they're around about the same size. In this paper, you're not actually studying Kopiluwak production itself, but Kopiluwak agro-tourism. So could you introduce us to this particular part of the industry? Yeah, so civic coffee tourism or coffee luwak tourism is something that came about in the kind of mid 2000s. And this was when civic coffee became known on the international market. It was featured in various film productions. Um, so it was in the, the bucket list with Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. It was on the Oprah Winfrey show. And so more and more people in the West became aware of this luxury product. So in Bali, which is one of the islands of Indonesia, where civic coffee is said to originate, it became quite popular for tourists to be able to go and sample Kopi Luwak in the place of origin. And so the tourist trail, which runs across the island from the south to the north, literally in a big straight line across the island, that's studded with different tourist activities. And so civic coffee tourism is a curated experience where you are welcomed, you get to see various exotic plants, you get to see what the coffee bushes look like, what a coffee cherry looks like, because most people only ever see a coffee bean, they don't see the cherry that it originates from. You're walked through this very pretty garden with everything labelled. Then you get to see some civets or what they call civet cats in some cages. You get to feed them some some coffee. You get to see their faeces. The faeces are actually usually either passed around for people to, to see up close or they're placed in a perspex box which sits on top of the cage of the civet. So actually the, the faeces is more of the show item than the animal itself. Then you get to go and sit with tradition. Well, usually it's a, an elderly Balinese woman who is roasting the beans on the fire. So you can have your photograph taken with her. You can then grind the beans using a big pestle and mortar. And then you get to sit overlooking the most spectacular jungle views. And then you get a flute of teas and coffees. And then for an optional fee of about five US dollars, you can try civic coffee. That's the premise from start to finish. Your study focuses on user-submitted reviews of these kinds of attractions. But what's really interesting is it seems like only relatively few of these reviews actually mention the encounters with civets. And one thing I noticed that you said was that only one out of well over 3,000 reviews that you were looking at mentions what you call a true animal encounter. So could you tell me a bit about the encounters that these reviews are telling us about and what the reviews are saying about the civets? Yeah, yeah. So I originally thought that people would be speaking about the civets because a lot of research, particularly in zoo research, shows that people are really after a what we call a true encounter. So where the animal interacts back with you. That can be very minor from eye contact. It can be the animal showing inquisitive behaviours towards you. It could be you holding them. But actually what I found is that the civets in the way that they were situated was also reflected in the tourist reviews in that they were just cogs in the machine. They were just part of the coffee making experience. And that's really how they're they're displayed. You feed them the coffee, you see what comes out the other end, and then you move on to the next part of the production line. And so actually the civets are there as a mouth to anus production line. That was really reflected in a lot of a lot of the comments. And you mentioned there that very few people were actually mentioning the civets at all. And actually, I thought that was one of the 
most interesting findings of the study. But early reviews said that, oh, this can't be something that's interesting then, because people don't care that the civet's there. And my argument has always been that actually that's a big finding in itself, because if the animal isn't of note, why are we caging them? Why are we placing them in these conditions? If they're not adding anything to the tourist experience, then we needn't be having them there at all. I also found that the civets undo the traditional narrative. One of the premises of copy luwak or civet coffee being so expensive is because it's so rare and civets are nocturnal. They're extremely elusive and they have a musk that they excrete as sort of part of their scent glands. And they give off this kind of popcorn buttery smell, which is very distinct. And so really a lot of the traditional stories of civets are that no one really knows what what they are, but but you know they're there because you can smell them. And that's really the only sign of them being around. So the fact that you're seeing civets in the daylight and in these cages means, well, hang on, these animals are being force-fed this coffee and there's hundreds of packets of coffee in this coffee shop and there's hundreds of tourists coming through every week. This coffee can't actually be that rare. And it's certainly not wild collected that was undoing the narrative of the product itself. So just over 10% of the reviews in your data set mention animal welfare concerns. But it seems like the reviews identify quite a wide range of welfare concerns at these sites. Yeah, well, the, the most obvious and so one of the most widely reported was stereotypic behaviour. And I think that comes primarily from um, zoo exhibits and how stereotypic behaviour has been well associated and the public are fairly savvy on knowing that if they see a tiger or any other animal in an enclosed space pacing, then that animal is suffering. Of course, we know that stereotypic behaviour is much more diverse or nuanced than that, and it could be that you see animals in sanctuaries that have been rescued. They exhibit these behaviours, but that's a coping mechanism from years of trauma and stress, or it might be a neurological dysfunction that has happened because of years of trauma and stress. So it may not be indicative of current welfare state. But when you compare it with the descriptions that the tourists were writing about in these reviews, you can very clearly see that these conditions are contributing to stress and the stereotypic behaviour in those moments. The conditions were all very similar across sites. So there was 3,000 reviews um, across about 25 different locations that all advertised themselves on TripAdvisor as having live civets on display. Um, I only was interested in looking at the facilities that had live civets. And all of the descriptions of stereotypic behaviour were the same. They tended to be things like this animal looks like it's gone out of its mind, that they've gone mad, that they were frustrated. It was quite visceral descriptions of trauma. And then the conditions were also explained to be very, very similar across sites, that it was all small, barren, dirty cages. And they were the most common words associated across the reviews. You also talked about the potential that some of these civets were being drugged. Yeah, so the way that I did the analysis was I went through each facility on TripAdvisor and then I went through each English review because I, unfortunately, that's the only language I speak. And so I went through each English review and then I scored them on these themes. What I noted, what I started to notice after I'd done maybe six or seven of these uh, facilities was that any that were prior to 2017, the word cage was the most frequent word when civets or any animal was mentioned. Because I, I may as well say as well that it's not just civets that appear in these these places. There was bats and chickens and snakes and, and all sorts of exotic animals as well as domestic. Yeah, so what I noticed is before 2017, cage was the most obvious word, the most frequent word. And then after 2017, the number of negative reviews or people that were ranking their experience terribly or as terrible and those terrible reviews that correlated with animal welfare concern became fewer. So essentially what we're seeing post-2017 was that people were 
being a bit more mild on their perception of their animal encounter. And then what I noticed is that at the same time that was happening, there was more cases of a positive experience being registered in relation to experiencing an animal. And so I thought, okay, there's something happening here. And so I I kept going and I kept going. And then I thought, okay, I need to start looking as well at the images that are being uploaded with, with these. So then I ran a separate analysis where I went through all of the images that were being uploaded. What I found was that the civets that were in the photos and in the descriptions prior to 2017 tended to be those that were in cages. They looked very malnourished. They looked in poor condition. They had injuries. It just, it wasn't, it clearly wasn't a pleasant experience. And you could see immediately, okay, yes, this is why there's lots of negative reviews. And then post-2017, it's more kind of plump looking civets that are curled up asleep in fact they're not even curled up kind of laid out asleep on a plinth and it was the same setup in a lot of different sites and it's where these civets are placed on a plinth inside the cafe where you go after you've tried civet coffee and then you're guided through to the exit via some very expensive coffees and wines and things like that and so the civets were there as this kind of photo opportunity but what I noticed is that for all of the civets that were positioned in this way, either their eyes were partly open, but they looked very glazed. They were lying in a way that you wouldn't typically see a wild animal lie because it exposes their most vulnerable parts of their body. So their their genitalia and their, their chest and their stomachs. And there was clearly lots of noise in the background of people posing with them and, you know, shuffling around in the background and they were clearly not moving. And so then I went back through the reviews again and I scanned for different words like drugged, sedated. And then I found a whole host of people who had not had proof, but had gone on to TripAdvisor explicitly to warn people not to go to these facilities because they believed the animals were being sedated. It's interesting that these concerns are about the civets in agro-tourism. Presumably, there's very different kinds of welfare concerns about the animals who are actually being used to produce civet coffee at scale. Yeah, and this is a really good point. So the thing that a lot of people didn't realise, or at least coming from their reviews, it looked like people didn't realise was that the amount of coffee on display could never have been produced by the three to six civets that were on display to the tourists. A few people, and I mentioned this in the paper, I do draw out a few examples where people have pointed out this disparity. But for the most part, any reviewer that questions where is all this coffee coming from explains typically that they took their concern to a member of staff and the member of staff said, oh yes, we collect it when the civets are let out at night. And so they're led to believe that these animals, these wild animals are left getting out of the enclosure at nighttime, foraging around the plantation. And I must say that most of these places aren't actually located in plantations. It's like one or two trees (laughs) that they've clearly brought in just to show what a coffee plant looks like. And then these animals come daylight when they want to go to sleep. They're then coming back to the enclosure, letting themselves in, being locked in and then pacing all day. It doesn't seem very likely. Incredible. Mm. I was going to ask a question about what makes civet so unique when it comes to digesting these beans. But I understand you've actually been recently taking part in a very striking research project that explores that question. Me and some colleagues have a paper coming out in a couple of weeks that is looking at the first case of human digested coffee. This all came about about two years ago when I just started the Civic Project. And so I had, and this was in lockdown, so I'd created a website to try and capture people's experiences because I couldn't go and see the plantations myself. And actually an email came through from two artists from Finland and they had just got back from Indonesia, luckily before the lockdowns happened. And they were doing a two year investigation of water and waste and how human society wastes so much, whether it's water being used to flush our our own waste down the toilet or whether it's us not utilizing 
our human waste like in other some other cultures do and so they had gone to indonesia and they had wanted to experience civet coffee and so they had eaten civet well they'd gone and eaten the the coffee cherries and they had produced through exactly the same methods the first human coffee i took the the human coffee and i took it to a lab down in brighton in the uk and we ran the beans through a scanning electron microscope which is the same method that you would use to see the structural properties of civet coffee in order to authenticate that yes this has come from a civet it hasn't just been picked and what we found was that there were no markable differences between coffee that had been digested from a civet or from a human can you take this further are we going to be tasting human coffee soon so this is a it's a running joke between me and my colleagues every time I'm on a zoom call and I've got a cup of coffee they're all expecting it to be that uh, so we, we haven't done a taste test yet it's not it's not a no it's not a yes <laughs> um, but we we haven't decided on that one yet there was two things that we wanted to really experience or experiment with with this project the first is what does it feel like to be a, an animal that is being commodified in such a way that their bodies become this machine what does it feel like to be a mechanized being and then the second was is the civet truly unique in producing this so that paper really answers that question as well as we can with the resources that we had i should say that the next thing we need to do is run a chemical analysis. So we'll be doing um, an SDS page, which measures how much protein is currently in the beans. Because it's said that if a coffee cherry goes through a civet's digestive system, because they're mesocarnivores and they are used to breaking down so much material, that really they should be extracting, the enzymes would extract and a large number of proteins, which is actually what makes the caffeine so strong and so bitter. So you would expect that we would have a difference between human and civet. So our study only proves that structurally there is no difference between the digestive systems of civets and humans. The next thing that we, we have already done, but that we will be taking slightly further is the other aspect of civet coffee's success is based on the claims that not only is it really rare, which we know it's not because we've got lots of evidence to show this is being created en masse, but that it's also, that it's the most expensive coffee in the world. And that's something you'll see time and time again. If anyone listening hasn't come across Civic Coffee before and they're typing it into Google, the first thing that will come up is it's the most expensive coffee in the world. And so as part of this experiment, what we did is we placed 20 grams of our human coffee, of which there is only 80 grams in the world. So we already know that this is the most rare coffee in the world. There's only 80 grams of it. So we split it into 20 grams and 20 grams is one cup of coffee. And then we placed that for sale. And we didn't have a starting bid. We thought, let's just do it and see if it could earn the same amount of money as a cup of Kopi Luwak. And Kopi Luwak tends to sell for about 50 US dollars per cup. And that was kind of in the height of its fame in kind of 2008, 2010. But it's around about that. Ours sold in a week of auction, ours sold for about 600, 600 euros because we sold it in Finland. So we now have the world's rarest and most expensive coffee in the world to try and challenge the claims of civic coffee. That's incredible. And if the lucky buyer of that human coffee is listening, let us know how it tastes. I'd, I'd love to know. I'd love to know too. <laughs> From someone else. Do you know who bought it? Um, I don't know. Now, I mentioned earlier that you founded the Civet Project, which, of course, is directly related to all these questions we're asking here. Could you tell us a little bit about that project? Yeah, so the Civet Project initially started, as I said, as a way of me trying to reach people that had been to Bali and had experienced Civet Coffee or, or even just Civet enthusiasts. Turns out there are some, but not many of us. The Civet Project has taken a new direction recently, 
And that's because the more research I've been doing into human civic relationships and the more I'm publishing, the more I'm realizing that I'm one of few people doing this. But also a lot of the issues I'm seeing with unethical interactions between humans and civets is because civets don't get a lot of attention for conservation because civets or palm civets at least are listed as common. And one of the, well, one of my biggest bugbears as an anthrozoologist is that we assign these statuses to animals that then dramatically impact their lives. And so that could be quite obvious from, we say you're a farm animal or your food. And of course that's going to dictate how we raise and kill you. Or it could be more subtle in that, oh, there's loads of you, you're a common species, so we'll let you be snared, we'll let you be a luxury meat, we'll let you produce civet coffee. And regardless of those being awful ethical decisions and the welfare impacts, it also means that we are creating a situation where these populations can't be sustainable. And it's only when we have enough evidence to show, oh, wait, we've made them almost extinct. Now let's put loads of resources in to try and help them. And in doing so, we'll take them from the wild and place them into captive breeding programs. And so one of my hopes with the Civic Project is that the more research we can do and the more we can spotlight this very ancient, very interesting and very understudied group of animals, maybe we can reevaluate how we assign priority status to species before it gets to the point where we have to intervene in much more drastic ways. Now, Jess, we ask every guest on Knowing Animals five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? Yeah, take it away. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Ah, now this is this is a really tricky one because I have been reading I've been reading animal books since I was able to read. Like animals have been such a big part of my life, life academically and personally for as far as I can remember. I think the first pro-animal book I can recall that I was aware was a pro-animal book would be Hal Herzog's Some We Love, Some We Eat, Some We Hate. And that was a suggested reading on the very first anthrozoology course I took as an undergrad. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? Mm. So again, I've been writing pro-animal work uh, for, for many years, whether it's blogs about being vegan or, I mean, I've done a lot of kind of personal writing on, on the topic. This paper, Cappuccino, is the first published piece or the first piece I wrote intended for publication. It wasn't actually the first one that that has been published, but it was the first one I wrote. So yeah, let's let's go with this one. If you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Mm. Now this this can change depending on what project I'm I'm delving into. I'd say for my thesis, my biggest influence would be Tom Van Doren. I do a lot with extinction narratives, lively ethnography, and I try to bring the animal perspective in as much as I can. So yeah, I think he would be up there along with Deborah Birdrose. Now, this is an interesting question, given that you work in animal protection as well as being an academic. What do you think is the most important thing that academics can do for animals? I think, honestly, I have to take this down to something that just seems so obvious to a lot of people, I think we need to stop eating them. I think everyone just needs to stop eating them because there's so many, there's so many people I engage with on a daily basis that are really, really passionate about particular animal issues. And that's great because they're supporting the animal issues that I'm advocating for. But a lot of it comes down to let's just stop eating them. And that might link to my next question, which is, if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human animal relationship, what would it be? The human? (laughs) 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 Uh, Yeah, I think it, I think again, it has to come back to how we engage with animals on a day-to-day basis. And when I say stop eating them, what I should say is stop consuming them because, and when, you know, I'm not saying that 
ethical vegans are perfect far from it like we're all trying right but the 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 lack of awareness that I've noticed in a lot of my research where people are then like so many people in the in the reviews that I read were outraged that it was only after they'd gone to the facility that they learned that these animals never left the cage and they felt lied to and they felt like they had contributed to poor ethics but I find it very hard to believe that if you see an animal in a cage, you wouldn't have a very visceral feeling of responsibility towards that animal. But clearly that isn't the case. So that's what I would change. I would make people more aware of how their actions directly or indirectly impact the lives of others, other species. What are you working on next? So other than trying to finish my thesis, I am... Um, creating civic the civic project into a charity because like I said it's kind of growing arms and legs of its own and I would really like to see that flourish so I'll be setting that up hopefully in the in the coming year because it's quite a complicated process that I need to iron out and academically I am hosting or co-hosting a conference called Emerging Voices for Animals in Tourism and that's with Professor Carol Klein from Appalachian State University. And yeah, we both have organisations that advocate for animals. So I've got the Civic Project, she's got Fanimal. And we are hoping that we can continue to build the momentum across disciplines for people having an interest in advocating for more ethical relationships between humans and animals and how that ties into the tourism and leisure space. And how can people find out more about your work? Easiest way is to go to theCivicProject.com. Well, thanks so much, Jess, for joining us for this podcast. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you, listeners, for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. You can follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook at knowing animals. You can follow me on Twitter at Josh L. Milburn or on Instagram at a vegan philosopher. Spread the word. Tell others about knowing animals. I'm Josh Milburn, and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.